breaking news this week to discuss on, on 9 to 5 Mac Happy Hour. This is a new report from The Information, and it is pretty big in the world of Apple. It is that Apple is apparently developing an iPad Pro keyboard with a trackpad. So a smart keyboard with a trackpad, a la Microsoft Surface. What do you think about that, Mayo? So. <laughs> right. So the what we've seen in iOS 13.4 is definitely uh, an investment in keyboard support for iOS, right? So we've seen stuff like the uh, key down, key up event stuff, uh, the remapping of the keys. We've also had correlating evidence from like Minchi Kuo, who said there was going to be a new smart keyboard coming this year. Didn't he say backlit? That was Digitimes. Digitimes. D- said D- it'd Digitimes. Be. Is Digitimes. Because that was why it was weirdly translated. So Digitimes yeah. said it'd be glowing. Oh, right? uh, okay. Yeah. So we'd say we say maybe black backlit from from glowing, but Digitimes is kind of yeah. Kinda, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think backlit is possible because the like unlike every other keyboard in the market, the Apple keyboard charges gets its power through the smart connector, and you know running one LED basically to do a backlight on the keyboard is pitiful power con- drain compared to you know, powering the iPad screen all day long. Yeah, so, yeah. Although Quo hasn't, like, you know, specifically gone out of his way to say it's backlit, I think backlit is perfectly within the remit of possibility. Now, none of those publications mention anything about trackpads. This is, you know, new from the information today. There's... And we haven't seen any, like, code references yet that support it, but, of course, if it was something Apple was, like, seriously developing... That might be one of the things where they've been really tightened down in stripping it out of the you know the beta releases until it's ready to go. Yeah, and like the, the status quo of of just cursor input in general or um, mouse or trackpad input is um, that it's it's an accessibility feature starting with iOS 13 that mm. improved through the beta process. It was rougher than than when they actually shipped it, um, but it's 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 built as accessibility because of you know that's that's what it, the idea is in mind is that it's it's, it's um, to be an alternative to touch input um, to you know replicate uh, a finger but with a uh, compatible mouse of some sort. Now the rules for what's compatible is all over the place and it seems to change. Uh, so it's it's just very complex as to like it's compl- complicated as to like what even works with it and then if it works with it, how well does it work with it? Um, and, and you can go pretty power user heavy if you're not using it for accessibility and like really trick out like a Logitech MX master mouse and assign actions to all the buttons on it. And I've done yeah, you that. Find all the buttons. Yeah. I've done that for the sake of, you know, just trying it and seeing what it's like. Uh, you can get the, the cursor on screen, you can make it pretty translucent so that it's not in your way. You can shrink it down, change the color of it. But it's not a cursor; it's a circle. The only thing that for me was like this is totally an accessibility feature, and not you know even like workaround trackpad mode or mouse mode is that you've also got that virtual home button always on the screen, which you yeah can you make. have to have assistive touch enabled. Yeah, you can make that super transparent, but it's always going to be there, and it's always a tap target that you've got to avoid. So that was my biggest hang up on it. Um, but nonetheless, like that is in the code for the first time, like as a feature you can use with iOS 13 as groundwork for something more to come, you know, possibly. Yeah, like, it's right now in accessibility for a reason in that it is not like a general customer. It's not meant to be a general customer feature, The even just basic things like scrolling with it. It's not the fluidity and seamlessness and niceness that you would expect from if they were like demoing it on the WWC DC stage, right? Like it's, it's definitely in accessibility for, the fact that it is meant for people who struggle to actually, you know, have have motor problems with their hands and moving a secondary input device is better than doing direct manipulation mm-hmm. on the screen. Of course, it could definitely be like foundations for, you know, a proper consumer, proper mouse input thing. But I, I don't like the idea of putting a proper cursor on iOS philosophically. And there's certainly been no, like, striking gun evidence that they're going to do it. Like, the problem for me with putting an act, like, like, doing, like, a Mac mouse cursor on the iPad 
is you start going down a path that I think we've seen a little bit with pro apps for the Apple Pencil, where they become like assumed that you have an input device that is that fine grained, which essentially starts making some of these apps like incompatible with touch input or they they have to overload so many gestures into you know moving the mouse in a way moving the apple pencil in a certain way that like i think all apps on the ipad should be very well usable and accessible and good using touch alone with exceptions like the drawing apps where you literally just you know you're if you're actually drawing then obviously you need a stylus but not just the if you're outside of the drawing canvas, like all of the controls around that, we've seen apps like Affinity uh, Photo and Affinity Designer and stuff, and they have a lot of power. But the way they expose that power is not very friendly to touch input. Like mm. you're almost expected to be using an Apple Pencil at all times. And there's definitely a category of apps that uh, can benefit in that way, and that's fine for people that like that. I worry that once you start adding. Uh, a trackpad to like a, you know like a default apple trackpad or everything then all the apps start assuming that a mouse is going to be very available they start designing uis in ways that aren't compatible with general touch input or become incredibly mac like to the point where it's like you might as well just be using a mac right like i think the ipad can stand alone as a very capable modern computer that can do advanced tasks without having to literally just bring over every idiom that exists on the desktop mm-hmm. and what I would hope, personally, and you know, a lot of people aren't going to like this, but what I personally hope for is that the trackpad that they're adding, uh, that because the information is pretty reputable, right? So I'm down to believe them. The, the trackpad feature that will be part of the new smart keyboard is maybe like only used for text input because that is one place where we do have a consumer cursor today in iOS. It's the key is the text input cursor, right? And you can simulate a trackpad by putting two fingers down on the virtual keyboard and dragging it around. And it's very annoying if you are trying to use an iPad with, you know, like a laptop-style mode where you have the screen propped up right and then you have a Mm. keyboard below where you type, 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 and then you want to select the the word and then you have to bring bring your hand up to the screen and drag it back. So I would say that's a direct point where having a trackpad can be incredibly useful and incredibly beneficial to writing and if you look at the kind of productivity apps that exist on the iPad today and the kind of ecosystems that do exist, writing apps, markdown editors, like, uh, you know, plain text editors are a very, very big popular segment and category. And being able to directly move the cursor from the physical keyboard without having to always reach up, you know, and peck at the screen in in the uh, on the vertical axis would be very beneficial. A- enough in my head that they can add the trackpad, and it basically only does that. And obviously it might work with the accessibility mode if you go and turn it on, but it wouldn't be like marketed in that way. You wouldn't be able to plug in the keyboard and then just start clicking apps on the home screen with a you know a crazy iOS cursor that's, that's now integrated into the system. They could make it still map to just like text input and then maybe it like has some gestures you can do for like extra shortcuts so you wouldn't be all pro about it. That, so like if you're on the home screen and you don't have a text field open so there's no, you know, text cursor to deal with at least it could do something like you could you know three finger swipe on it to bring up the multitasking and kind of you know kind of like what you can do on a mac right just without the actual like straight cursor part of it i think that would be fine i think unless they're very very careful just adding a straight cursor to ios will backfire on them eventually for for me um the the when when i when i've tried this before with serious intent it was the period where i had a macbook uh sold an imac sold and i was like in between macs for a couple of days before i got the 16 inch macbook pro and so i wanted to use my ipad pro as capable as it is to its full potential as like you know do my do my work that i do on my mac but do it on my ipad and um you know there's there's big limitations that you hit there like the ability to just have a bunch of windows spread out overlapping each other and then click the one that you want to be activated, like just how Mac OS works with windows. Um, and, and you don't get that, but you can get pretty close if you work within a few apps and multitasking and really master slide over and, um, and that kind of thing. Um, but he, and, and even so, like that, that's that's possible. I'm still slower than I am on the Mac for for that. Um, my work like I've not been able to do my workflow on the iPad in that way, where the speeds 
re- replicable. But the the thing's weird is just like just navigating on the UI. Um, so it, it's it's easier once you map. Um, you know, if you've got a bunch of buttons, which a trackpad wouldn't necessarily have, it'd be gesture based, which would be okay. But if you've got buttons on a mouse to assign to going to the home screen, um, going to multitasking, like all those things, then a button it feels all right. Um, but something like pulling down notification center, pulling down control center, or like clicking and dragging to the home screen, those feel very slow compared to using your finger with direct manipulation. Um, cause it's, it's so far, like you're just not used to doing that on the, on the Mac where you've got a pull down to see a thing or pull over to see a thing. Uh, it's just all click based and you don't, you can't like click to go to the home screen or click to go to, um, control center, notification center. It's all click and drag. So it's, it's one more step to it. Um, but I, but, but, but being in that position where, um, in the, in that few days span of time, I didn't have a Mac. Like I wanted the iPad to be as Mac like as possible. And that's how I got there was a Bluetooth keyboard and Bluetooth mouse and then prop up the screen. And like, it was pretty close. Um, but again, it's just that, that, you know, the way that you manipulate dragging things around and, um, then, then the lack of, uh, you know, full windowing where you can just put as many windows on top of each other as you want. Um, so that, that's the thing, but, but I, so I think for the sake of the iPad, like, you know, I get your philosophy, you know, your philosophical, um, hesitation to where it could affect the quality of apps and, and how they could, you know, you could have a tier of apps that are like some are, some are tuned to mouse input that you can't always assume is there and some are not. But we've, we've already got that with the pencil, like you mentioned. Um, it wouldn't kill the iPad if that's what happened further. Um, you, the popularity of this thing, uh, uh, if that's how you start to use iPad Pro, like iPad, you just assume kind of iPad is like the touchscreen uh, input, but iPad Pro, you started thinking of iPad Pro as like touch sometimes, but mouse input often and keyboard. Um, I think there's demand for that, and people. Oh, have, de- yeah, there definitely is demand. Yeah, like yeah. I, my position is not like the the popular one, right. right? Neither is Apple's. Like Apple's position to keep the Mac without touch input at all, and then have the iPad, you know, be a whole separate thing, like. There's always people that want those two things to merge or to be somewhere to each other or just put touch on the Mac or just put a you know cursor on the, on the iPad. Um, so yeah. if they put a trackpad on the iPad and it could and it was just like a general purpose trackpad, I think they lose any grounds for saying that the Mac shouldn't have a touchscreen. Yeah, I agree. And and when they do the Mac Catalyst apps, where it's the same interface across both for the most part, like say for a sidebar, you know, or some things being fine tuned, they're already losing ground to that argument there. You know, and the motivation is different. It's that that there just aren't as many apps supported on the Mac, um, or the same class of apps supported on the Mac and similar from the apps that there are on the iPad. Um, but but they're already losing ground on that, that argument there. Um, something that I don't think been explored enough that I think would be kind of cool is, you know, with Apple TV and TVOS, you've got a trackpad on the Siri remote, mm-hmm. and you've got a user interface that you manipulate with the trackpad without a cursor, and it's what do you call it focus mode focus engine yeah yeah focus engine and so what's what happens is that you manipulate what is in focus what's like the largest thing on the screen and there's just no question about what it is now sometimes it's it's like a text list there's like a box that you move around you know and but there's never a question of where am i even if it's the home screen it's like the bigger app is the one that's in focus you know um I've, i've never been on the apple tv as many issues as it has and been like where am I focused on right now? It's super clear without a yeah, cursor. You know, that's what's funny, actually, is some people do complain about that. And I don't, I'm with you, right? I never mm. get lost like that. If you do get uh, in that state, if you go into accessibility settings, there's a uh, increased contrast option. Mm. And that will literally just put like a white ring around ah. the enlarged box. So you literally, there's, you know, if, if, you, if you're wary on the focus system because of the losing your place, you can turn that on, and then there's literally just a massive white box around it. You yeah. never, you never lose where you were. Yeah, and that isn't, isn't even like a wholly original thought because I think whenever our TVOS, you know, what was the first version like ten? Yeah, came out or nine or whatever. Then we were yeah, like, like D-pad control interfaces are basically like very premature yeah. focus engine systems, right? That's, that's right. You can only go left, right, up, down. That's right. And the focus engine added a bit of like because you can kind of like parallax on a single item mm-hmm. which, uh, on the trackpad and you can obviously fly through like many items at once but it's fundamental level it's 
you know, D-pad enhanced, yeah. right? And it feels like direct manipulation, like whenever you're you're playing around with the parallax of an of an app mm-hmm. icon on TVOS, like you're it's under your thumb, even though it's across the room on the TV. Yeah. Um, and that's part of what you no, want I, to maintain with the iPad is that you've got direct manipulation and not like remote input, you know, some other way. Yeah, I a hundred percent think they should bring the focus system to iOS. Uh, I don't think they should expose it for like a trackpad. I think they should do it for the keyboard, right? Well, what's the difference so, in a trackpad and the Siri remote? I mean, so that's a trackpad under your thumb. You know what I mean? Uh, the the difference is that on the Apple TV, they don't have a choice. You can't put a touchscreen on on the, on the TV, yeah, right? It could be a cursor though go... that you move around with the trackpad, but they didn't do that. Okay, I don't think they should. <laughs> right, I think that at that point it's too. It, you you should touch the screen, uh-huh. right? Okay, because it's right there. Like uh, what I think they should have in my idealized world of the future of the iPad, which we all we already know is far far apart from the current state of the iPad. Uh, is they would have a new smart keyboard accessory that doesn't have like a physical trackpad area on it, but it has capacitive keys so that you can do the kind of the same gesture you do on the software keyboard where you put two fingers down and you trackpad around on the keys, right? So you don't have to reach up to the screen. You can just do it by like glazing over your fingers over over the, the flat horizontal keyboard. And that would control the text cursor, and maybe you could do two finger scrolling on like a Safari web view, right? Mm-hmm. But there wouldn't be an actual pointer cursor on the screen. Yeah, treat treat and the then, software keyboard and the hardware keyboard very similar. Yeah, and then you would have uh, like using Tab or using the arrow keys combined with a focus engine. So if you're if you're on the iPad, you're typing full down, and because a lot of the time at the moment it will be like, uh, you know, you type something and then you want to switch tabs. Uh, but if there isn't a direct shortcut for it, then you've got to like reach up with a screen. So if you could have more of the focus system, because you kind of have a mini focus system on the Mac, right, where you can like tab through controls in a window and mm-hmm. you can select them. I think they should bring that to the iPad through a hardware keyboard system and then have you know, the kind of capacitive trackpad system. At least right now, I can't see... I think there's going to be... It's kind of like short-term sugar rush of, oh, you've actually just got like a straight mouse on the screen. You can just click on things. I think down the road that degrades the experience uh, badly and worse than what we see with the Apple Pencil because at least with the Pencil, uh, it's still like an add-on accessory. It's not as integrated as like the keyboard thing would be and it's still kind of in the domain of artistry. I think... I, I worry that once you put like a mainstream trackpad cursor, you would see like every app start becoming incredibly like max size controls max size windows and the touch the touch experience would suffer from it and if you're looking for an ios laptop obviously that's what you want Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. there's there's a demand for that where i'm going (laughs) yeah yeah i mean maybe the ipad pro just gets so but i mean the problem is ipad os is its own thing and that you're not going to have apps that are you might have a different audiences but it's going to be the same app that runs on the ipad mini as the ipad pro even if the ipad pro gets to be like 16 inches yeah, I think we struggle at the moment to have iPad apps that actually take advantage of the touchscreen. And then as soon as you add in like alternative, like my kind of root of this philosophy is, well, they're only adding, you know, they would only add a cursor because they're trying to make up for the fact that touchscreen input is still bad, right? And I think they'd be better off investing in better touchscreen input controls. We never had like force mm. touch on the iPad, for instance, where I think it'd actually be really beneficial because there's so much long pressing going on on iPad OS, where mm-hmm. if you could do that faster with a force press, uh, that would be beneficial. Plus also just like UI things that make it more capable instead of being like, oh, you know what? You can just, you know, move this mouse around and click a button. Like mm-hmm. that, that obviously is a tried and tested thing. And we've seen it on the Mac for 20 years or, or you know, more than that now, four mm-hmm. years. Uh, but I think the future of the iPad has, you know, ambition and potential to be a go beyond that and direct military touch is so compelling for so many people that if you actually want to advance the platform forward to be more capable without like because at the moment the ipad uh like i guess i guess it's kind of a problem with all sorts of ipad features but like you have the basic level where it's basically like acting like a big phone where you have like one app at a time you click on stuff you do it you swipe it away and everyone can understand that it's immediately understandable easy to use and way more convenient and intuitive than 
a laptop or, or, or a desktop computer to the point where kids can do it, right? Mm-hmm. And then you have that, that kind of like second tier where you start doing like file manipulation, multi-window stuff. And and if you include uh, cursor input stuff into that, I think you end up with more of that second group, mm-hmm. right? And so you're just bringing this like massive chasm in between the two worlds. Yeah, and, and this has always been the struggle. This has always been the struggle of iOS is how much to expose, how much to borrow from the Mac, and then how much to do different, do better because you started yeah, over. Like, they've, they've done a great job since version one of making the simpler things really, really simple and not uh, making the hard stuff in the way of when you're just trying to you know, go to Safari or go home, Yeah, right? But... The reality is, for the iPad to properly replace laptops and desktops, which I think it can still do in the you know in the fullness of time when they support it correctly with the right you know the right features and the right interaction models and stuff. But to do that, you're going to have to make the stuff that is currently like on that. Like it, at the moment, there's not like a smooth curve between going from the super simple stuff to the hard stuff. Mm-hmm. There's like a big chasm jump where you suddenly have to learn all this other stuff. Think more like a desktop and. In my head, the cursor pointer stuff falls more into that second column. And I think they need to be working on ways to smooth the gap and make the hard stuff easier. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there will always be super hard stuff that always requires learning and teaching. And and that's fine. But I think there are things that, you know, relatively basic, quote unquote, difficult stuff that is way too hard on the iPad today for, you know, regular people to, to, to grog. And even me sometimes, I'm like... Yes, I know how to do it, but I don't think it's a harmonious model across the system. It feels very like isolated and they've had this core interaction model that they don't want to impact in any way and they don't want to hurt it. But then that just ends up with all this other stuff being like lopsided on the side. You swipe over here, this thing happens, you swipe on the bottom, this thing happens, you go to multitasking, but that thing doesn't interact with this thing. Like this whole big like soup is kind of the core like theme of, you know, my dissatisfaction with iPad OS. Mm, yep. Yeah, I I think I think as it as it relates to cursors and what we think they ought to do, I appreciate what you're saying. I'm not with you, but I understand what you're saying. Um I think in the perfect world they would take the harder approach and yeah. solve problems to make the harder things easier in a different way. Um in the world that we live in, we've just been begging them to, you know, just expose capability of this this incredible sure. hardware yep. and that it's equally frustrating when they just don't do that. And so if they do the, the Band-Aid method for now, then it will make a lot of people happy. A hundred percent. Like that's, <laughs> that's why, you know, what I'm saying will be unpopular because it will make people happy. Yeah. But I would call it like, I would see it as like a shortcut uh-huh. and they're not doing the groundwork that I think they really have to do. And at some point down the road, it will bite them in the behind for not doing it. And then they'll side with the, the iPad into this like, you know, it's basically a laptop. So the core idea of, you know, making computing accessible to everyone is kind of lost. Right? Yeah. And, th- and I think this is all a product of Apple being the iPhone company and services company and not Apple being the iPad company that also has these other things. Like they're, they make the iPad, but that's not their main focus. They're still struggling with like the identity of iPad and Mac, like giving the iPad, they, uh, you know, and this isn't like an indictment of recent Apple. I think they've had this problem since the first version, right? Like, yes. It, all along, I think we've seen them struggle to add complexity of of capability without making it just like complicated, right? And I do think I, you know, I don't have to do all the answers. I don't want to be like, oh, you know, just do just do this. this. Yeah. Apple should. Yeah, yeah, it's not easy. It's hard, right? Oh. But Apple is like in a perfect position to do that stuff. And in some places, I think they succeeded really, really well. Uh, but in the in the large whole, I feel like there's a massive stack of things that they should be working on, which is can be perfectly based around touch input hmm. that they haven't that they haven't tried. Right, like even even just like in iOS 13, they finally were like, you know what, we could do a three finger gesture to do cut, copy, and paste controls. And those are ones that are, I I do not remember and could not teach you. If, if yeah, I had yeah. To. They definitely, they definitely <laughs> didn't succeed in in the direction of of that stuff. Uh-huh. But literally, until iOS thirteen, there were no like system three tap gestures. And if they'd have done it properly, or better, or had 
this stuff, you know, five years ago, sure. it might become ingrained more into the system and not just another thing that adds on the big pile of things that you can do with the iPad. That yeah, aren't really if, I, if I worked from the iPad every day, I'd sure, I'm sure I'd master them and they'd become second nature, just like all the gestures on the trackpad of the MacBook. I mean, I've, yeah. I've got 10 years experience using those, so they're they're easy. But there was a learning curve at first. Yeah, don't get me wrong. The Mac is hard and the the iPad is is, is you know, learnable and hard yeah yeah but in the ideal world you'd be making the ipad learnable but also have you know, most um, of the things be easier you know the right? videos like, and the... i'm not one of these people that the mac's so much more intuitive than the ipad it's not it's, it's hard perfect there's nothing wrong with it like everything should be like no 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 no. i think that's completely wrong i think there's hundreds of things <laughs> wrong with them with the, the, mac, the, the mac is and rigid and at, unforgiving you look at the world Everyone wants to use iPads, right? Like, <laughs> people do not want to be using laptops. They're just kind of, like, forced to because of, you know, just natural ecosystem plays and yeah. the fact that the capability is, is you're just generally slower to do it on the iPad. But I don't think it's, like, inherent that we can never get to a point where the iPad can be as efficient but also simpler than what the Mac achieved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, the Mac is less forgiving than the iPad. You can do some serious damage there as a as a user just exploring um, it's also very rigid where you've got to you've, you've got to know the system to be able to use it where in the iPad you can explore more um, and but then there are things about the 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 the, the, the MacBook form factor that I think that the iPad is learning but hasn't gotten there yet like just the ability to be yeah, like the addition <laughs> of having a physical keyboard uh-huh. I don't have a problem with that right like I think that was a good direction where they have they are making like you know and it increases productivity dramatically and there's no obvious way where they could you know, 100% replace the speed and typing efficiency of an actual keyboard Mm -hmm. with just the glass keyboard. Even if you could do that, you're still having to take up like half of the iPad screen just with the keyboard when the keyboard's raised, right? The virtual keyboard. So when you you have a physical keyboard, you can retain using that whole, you know, 12.9 inch form factor canvas just for the content manipulation Mm -hmm. stuff. So adding the physical keyboard is perfectly fine. I think the mouse would distort things personally yeah. yeah i'm sure i we'll, we'll guess we'll see what happens here yeah one thing i do want to say is the information story says that uh this keyboard accessory would come with the ipad pro later this year yeah so that you know is like full time frame right a lot of other rumors we've been seeing have been saying there's going to be an ipad pro refresh a lot sooner than that like march april time uh there was a there was a um digital times report that the Chinese company uh, had started taking orders for a mini LED iPad at the end of the year. And of course, we heard from Quo that there would be mini LED iPads in late 2020. So maybe we're in for like a double iPad year of like a epic proportions where you do have a refresh in in the spring. But then like the really cool one with this new keyboard accessory is like a Christmas product. It wouldn't be unlike the Mac lineup where you had the 15-inch MacBook Pro get faster and then the 16-inch MacBook Pro replace it with the same processor. If you're running your own business, just take a moment and think about all the hours you spend moving information from one program to another just because the apps don't directly support the right file format or whatever stupid reason. Surely there's a more intelligent way to do this, and that's where Zapier comes in. Zapier is the easiest way to automate your work. It connects business software so they can work together. Computers are smart and Zapier helps you to wield that untapped power to automate common tasks, speeding up your daily process. Automating tasks not only makes things faster, it eliminates human mistakes, making the output reliable and consistent, day in, day out. Just go to our special link, zapier.com slash happy hour, to get started. Connect up the apps you use most, and let Zapier take it from there. Zapier supports more than 1,500 business applications, so there's a night and limited number of integrations that you can create. For instance, you could connect your email and your Dropbox together so that once someone sends you an attachment to your business email, you can have that attachment automatically saved to a folder in your Dropbox, and then Zapier can notify you that there's something new to check out. Join more than 4.5 million people who are saving an average of 40 hours per month just by using Zapier. Now, right now, through the end of the month, you can try Zapier for free by going to our special link, zapier.com slash happy hour. That's Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com slash happy hour for your free 14-day trial. Thanks to Zapier for supporting the show. Again, zapier.com slash happy hour. 
like you say, this thing sounds like it's going to be coming in the end of the year and not like in the spring if it happens. And I also kind of feel like with the coronavirus that everything production wise, like hardware production wise out of China, is just up in the air as to when it will be released. That it's just yeah, all... especially anything that isn't an iPhone. That's, like exactly, you, you can imagine Apple Apple's operations team. They're just scrambling, right? Anything iPhone related, we have to prioritize because yeah. that's the we're, core. We're making a new iPhone everything. this year, no matter what, and everything else is is in the background. Um, but if this thing is is later, there there is uh, a lot of groundwork for keyboard improvements and how keyboards are handled in iPad OS thirteen point four beta. Um, and you don't necessarily need a new keyboard product to go with that to be like a part of a grander story because Apple has made keyboards for the iPad since the first version. It's And they've supported keyboards since the first version. It's just that if these things are timed, it, it's tidy to put, it, to put them together. Um, but but what are some of the changes that are coming in, in iPad OS 13.4 as it relates to keyboards? Yeah, so obviously we talked about a couple of weeks ago the ability to get the key events for separately for key press down and key press up mm -hmm. which is useful for ipad productivity apps when it used to just be key, the... key key up is what you would register as a single thing and there's no key is that right yeah the, yeah and like so so uh not only could you not get like key down and key up separately you also wouldn't be able to get like a long press gesture before right sure because you know quite a, quite a common thing on the mac is if you're in like a complicated app if you like hold the space bar down it kind of does something and then it you know extends the selection for however long you're holding it down for as an as a first party app as a third party app you couldn't do that at all until 13.4 on ios because you'd only get told the app would only get told when the key was released so an example of that is um what's the gesture or what's the keyboard shortcut on the ipad where you can is it just hold down com the command key and you can see the keyboard shortcuts yeah, hold on. And so iPad yeah, OS can command, do that, yeah. but apps couldn't do that. Like if they they can show that, but they couldn't like make their own shortcut for a long press thing like that. Yeah, because the the hold down command is like a system thing which mm -hmm. shows the panel. So obviously yeah. that works in third party apps. But say if say if a, an app wanted to, you hold down Shift and then suddenly you get all these different capitalization options. Compose a new tweet. Yeah, yeah, it couldn't happen, right? Yeah. Uh, and I feel like on the Mac, there's loads of opportunities where you can. And obviously, games are games are a part of that. Where a lot of times you're you're like you're pressing right in a game, where you hold the right button down. You don't keep pressing it repeatedly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, key input is definitely a big, uh, definitely a big win, both for Catalyst and for you know iPad stuff. Uh, especially, I still want them to do like some sort of like podcast editing app or GarageBand mm -hmm. for iPad, well, not GarageBand, but like Logic for iPad. Mm -hmm. You know, something. I think they could do a really good or like proper iMovie for iPad because the iMovie ios app is kind of rubbish like <laughs> oh. it's not it's not good right if they could have something that was like final cut mini i think that you could do a great version of that which was like and you 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 scroll along the timeline with your finger but if you want to actually like do an operation you just press the single letter key you know cut here do here scroll along with you so you, you kind of be doing like a two-handed thing i think there's a lot of scope there where you wouldn't have to alienate anyone that doesn't have a keyboard because you could still have like the little you know like toolbar where you press it and then you go through the menu and you select the option. But if you do have a keyboard there, you know one tap on these buttons. Oh, you want to um, you know hold down the key for four seconds. Okay, you've selected a four second clip. Right, there's loads of scope there for stuff that they could do. Uh, you also have uh, they've also just added keyboard shortcuts to more apps now, like the Photos app in thirteen point four mm -hmm. has rich keyboard shortcuts. You can go through all the tabs you can do searches you can do tagging you can flick through different pictures all of that kind of stuff didn't exist before so there's definitely preparation there for you know richer keyboard support you have the remapping that we mentioned so if you don't like using caps lock for caps lock you could make that escape and you can do the same for you know, five five of the other like modifier keys and then you have uh new in the latest beta i believe is full keyboard access which again is an accessibility feature uh, but that enables you to set up loads of custom like keyboard shortcuts that do basically whatever you want. You can even like assign um, shortcuts, like not <laughs> assign workflow shortcuts to keyboard shortcuts, mm -hmm. right? So it's like Siri shortcut stuff, you could assign to a keyboard input. So if you really are a power user, you could have a shortcuts fire based on the full keyboard access stuff. Nice. So, so, so that will all improve. Um, and if there is an, a, a new keyboard with a trackpad, then it's it's nice that these are all tied together. But these things, it's not necessarily related that you got to have this because, like, like I mentioned at the top, you know, Apple's supported keyboards for a long time. This is all just necessary. Um, 
One thing I wanted to mention before we get off the topic of iPads and and uh, and all this this stuff is, you know, in the Mac um, in the system preferences, when you go to either the, the the trackpad or if you're using Apple's Magic Mouse, the the mouse settings, they have literal videos of people using the devices to show you what gestures yeah. do. <laughs> That's what the iPad needs because you know, I mean, they do have text descriptions. Like, no, they do it when you first set up the iPad. They do have little videos. Mm, well. but they're not they're not comprehensive and you can't find them again once you leave the little like, yeah you can find like the, the white welcome setup screen on the mac you find those videos whenever you go to the settings and like toggle them on and off they've got like literally filmed footage of somebody manipulating the trackpad and like showing you the gesture um and i think that helps like if you learn by listening or seeing or doing like those are different methods of learning um that it could be useful to just go in the settings app on the ipad and like you know poke around at the gestures and not just have a text description of what gestures you know do and and that's only if you can turn them off that you even get that that um but just you know and maybe that the tips app is what they they the want to app, yeah, they want to do that with mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that <laughs> making that like yeah, the part of the OS those, is good. Cause they have like, they have like four videos, I think, uh, when you first set up your iPad and one of them is like, you know, swipe from the bottom of the screen to reveal the dock, yeah. swipe from the right to reveal slide over, drag an icon from the dock to the middle of the screen to, you know, put into split view. And I think that's about it. And he's like, skip, but skip, 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 go to the home Exactly. Like, skips. <laughs> everyone's skipping it. Like yeah. no one's reading, <laughs> no one's watching those videos. You just unboxed your fancy new iPad and you, you just pressing next, next, next. You've already said no to like location and Siri and all these, you know, these four <laughs> other things that it wants you to say yes to. Uh, you've just set up face ID. You want to be using the iPad. You're not interested in watching. Like, these I'll videos. do all this later. And there's no later. Right. And even if you have someone who does watch these videos, they won't remember it. Like yeah. you can't have these things happen only once for people to get it. And you know, fixing that is part only to do with repetition to be able to go and find those tutorials again. And part of it is just making gestures that are more intuitive. And obviously, that feeds into like you know reimagining multitasking to a more sane arrangement. I'm gonna start spending time with the tips up on the iPad just to <laughs> see what I can <laughs> learn. You know. Uh, all right, so we've we've got those changes with the with the iPad keyboard situation. Um, one thing that I think I just have to say is that uh, I I imagine that this iPad keyboard with the trackpad will just be expensive because the um, smart key- keyboard is expensive. Yeah, smart keyboard folio is like you can spend two hundred dollars or more on that. I think, uh, and that's without a trackpad. And so if they implement a backlighting system, then that's one more component. If they introduce a trackpad of some sort, that's a mega another component. Um, and and so I bet this thing will be crazy expensive, and that you're getting into Mac territory in terms of how much you spend on this thing altogether it's just that you prefer the os and and the option for touch input and, and you know what what a tablet can do is as a, a more versatile um, yeah and obviously you know apple will be then selling because they already have smart keyboard for the old generation ipads then you have smart keyboard for ipad pro <laughs> right the you know the modern ipad pro design nothing ever so dies we'll have a third tier which is smart keyboard pro with trap <laughs> yeah. man yeah so that's that's exciting. Um, let's also talk about just just a, 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 something new with the iPad that was mentioned this week, and this comes from the shareholder meeting. So um, Craig Federighi, who is in charge of sort of you know iOS and iPad OS and Mac OS at Apple, had a comment in a shareholders meeting on Apple's campus this week that was about the iPad. What what's that about? Yeah. So. The shareholders meeting was a big mess as normal. As usual, yeah. As usual. Crazy stuff. There was stuff. one, I'd say this was the only decent question that they that they held because they only ask like eight questions anyway uh, and most of them are complete. I think that the, that the smarter people in the room aren't asking questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not that everyone there is, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sure the executive team at Apple know it's like they just have a humor these people and then they have to, you know, give them, give them a cup of tea and then they leave eventually. But one one person did ask, what about the situation where iPadOS software is lagging behind the hardware capability? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, obviously Apple is not going to talk about new features or anything here. But what uh, Craig Federighi said was, if you like what you've seen us do with iPadOS, stay tuned. We're going to keep working on it. <laughs> well, some of us don't like what you've been doing with iPadOS recently, so that's a, a bad a bad start on the footing. But I know what he means. Obviously, he means they're obviously going to keep developing iPadOS and making it better and better, and better which is great. Uh, if you want to think like on the timeline, though, so far we've seen major iPad software upgrades come every two years. 
Last year was the first time they branded it as iPad OS, which gave some people hope that maybe now they'll be getting like, you know, a decent feature set for iPad specifically every single year. I don't think that's a sure thing though, and I wouldn't be surprised if we iOS 14 comes along and you can basically tell obviously iPad OS and iOS 14 will get the same base set of features, but I think you probably uh, I think it's not unreasonable to expect a situation where again you'd be waiting until iPad OS 15 for like another big attempt at attacking iPad specific problems. Well, I mean even iPad OS 13 is like arguably you look at the site side by side for iOS 13 and iPad OS 13 and there's a lot of redundancy there and, and not just base features but just like what are features exclusive to iPad, you know. And, and yeah, although they did, you know, they did they did change multitasking, even though. Well, it's it's it changed it, but it's it's the same. I think the same logic as giving. I mean, I think we're both in agreement with this anyway. But yeah. um, it, they've always done iPad only features <laughs> that, that are unique to it. Um, yeah, I would say I would. I, 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 I'd give them some credit that there was, like, if you look at the whole history, I think you can point to like iOS nine, iOS eleven, iOS thirteen as being times when they seem to have like big humps in number of ipad specific things right Mm -hmm. and they had you know pretty big overhauls to the files app they had all the slide over stuff because you can do all the slide over much stuff that that concept didn't exist before yeah split Mm -hmm. multiple apps of the same window right doing multitasking like i think they and you know the biggest disappointment obviously was that the home screen redesign was just putting some widgets on the left so that was kind of sad but you know that i think if you were going to label it this would definitely be like the ipad year and if you're following the pattern, you won't get that again until iOS 15. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so based on what Craig says, uh, we have no clue what's happening next. Well, they're going to keep working on yeah. it and then they'll tell you about it next year. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> there's that. All right. Let's talk about something that happened over the weekend, which is that the uh, U.S. retailer Target had um, – we received a bunch of tips and, and you know, an um, short order um, of inventory listings and targets inventory that were for future products. And I think we always can look at it with a grain of salt of like, you know, we're always super skeptical of, of things that are, just don't make sense. Like, will Apple tell target um, for all the retail employees to see their whole pipeline, you know, coming on the next few months. And um, you know, the obvious answer to that is no. Um, but, but there were some interesting things here to talk about. And just my takeaway from it is that, iPhone aside, there are an awful lot of things accessory wise or like just smaller products wise that we expect this year, you know, or sometime soon. Um, even yeah. if it's the usual things like some of these things mentioned are the you know new Apple Watch bands. Okay, well, there's always new seasonal colors um, a new Apple TV. We've been kind of hearing about that for a while now. Um, new iPod Touch, that would be different because this would be the first time they, they take a, a processor and upgrade it, you know, after a year or so. Um, but, but again, the, the context of all this is that it could just be placeholder for the sake of it and not actually something coming. Um, but there were some interesting yeah. things, things around AirPods and, and that kind of thing too, right? Yeah. Like this kind of started by uh, a YouTuber called John Prosser. He shared photos of the target inventory system showing a th- listing for AirPods Gen X. That was the, or, you know, AirPods X generation. That was the, the that was the name of the thing. And it was priced at three ninety nine in the target system. And immediately everyone was like, oh, that's the new Apple over-ear headphones, right? Like, Because the uh, Beats Solo Pro were like 350 to 399 Okay, that's the Apple version. Fair enough. You know, I was going along with it. I was like, okay, okay. I think once we got the flood of placeholder listings for Apple TV Gen X, iPod Touch X Generation, Apple Watch Series X Band, iPads, right? at that point it was... I, my position shifted from this was actually something of value to, you know, some target employees just added placeholder listings for all of It's like stuff. classic and, Wikipedia when anyone can go in and add it and yeah. populate it. And obviously, you know, the human brain is great at making things fit together. And as you said, there are so many Apple products on the table to be updated soon. You know, it's not hard to to link these things together. Uh, when and, and like, we have seen on occasion stuff show up in big retailer inventory system yeah, totally yeah. and then come out for real but that's like the day before right or mm-hmm. the night before or the weekend and then apple announces it on the tuesday do you know what i mean like mm-hmm. the, the 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 timeline between it coming into the inventory system and then being announced is relatively short right like this 
there's just too many too many products especially when you start throwing like the ipod touch up ipod touch <laughs> update in there for it to actually be like connected like if i was going to have any st- any credence to the target inventory listings converting into you know someone actually knows that a product is coming yeah. out i would have expected one of those things to already be out right like the fact that they're just kind of like hanging around in the system you know apple isn't telling even the biggest retailers in the world about their product roadmaps a month out two months out three months out you can see how there could be some like difference in communication where they sent max at the weekend and they were going to announce them on monday and they ended up showing in the target system a day early right Mm -hmm. that situation is understandable and this started on the weekend so the saturday so i was like oh maybe we'll see the airpods uh maybe we'll see some apple wireless audio product announced next week and obviously that hasn't happened so Mm -hmm. the combination of that timing plus the fact there's just so many placeholder listens for like every single product on on the market i've kind of like discounted this as being anything of you know of actual tangible connection to the actual product roadmap right just to say that you know this is a good reminder that man there's a lot of stuff coming yeah because it's small stuff exactly like you don't need target placeholder listings to know what's coming soonish that's right? right that's right tv apple tv update new ipad pros uh iphone se2 or if you really want to call it the iphone 9 go ahead uh spring apple watch bands right like that stuff is coming it somewhere between march and june most likely right hmm. like so someone's come along and been like you know what we'll just add a load of gen x quote-unquote listings to the target database yeah maybe Uh, because they were just getting ready for it because they were anticipating it or maybe they were just having a little prank right yeah having a little little bit of fun that's the status quo of that yeah uh and and, and, you know we we mentioned something airpods like that are these over-the-ear headphones from apple that have been rumored for a couple of years now that are the apple version of sort of beats solo pro um but there's this other airpod rumor that keeps floating around that that's kind of a weird one where it's referenced by digitimes at least as, as airpods pro light and it's a weird one because like you know if you think of a cheaper version of airpods pro well it's airpods that aren't pro that that are you know they, they don't have as high as a price tag um there's one thing they could do to just lower the cost of airpods pro if they wanted to which is do the bad thing of having a not wireless charging case <laughs> option like they do with regular airpods um i don't know if that's what this is but what do you think about this i haven't given it much thought or attention yeah uh, i mean digitimes is pretty persistent about it i've had like a story every week on it for the last month that apple is apparently ramping up production for airpods pro Lite. uh so right now you've got airpods without the wi- without the wireless charging case normal airpods at 159 right you've mm-hmm. got airpods with wireless charging case at 199 and then you've got airpods pro at 250 dollars so basically you've got 50 dollar increments there's not really room in there to add a fourth product so if there was going to be another one in the lineup you would hopefully expect that the uh, 159 airpods with non wireless charging case would hopefully go away right and then they'd somehow shift the prices a bit so something fit in between. And my guess at what an AirPods Pro Lite could be would be the form factor of AirPods Pro, but you don't have like the noise cancelling, the active noise cancelling stuff, so you'd only be relying on the passive seal mm-hmm. of the in-ear buds, right? Like Powerbeats Pro. Yeah, like Powerbeats Pro. But the fact that you can name Powerbeats Pro off the cuff and is that, right, exactly. there's only a hundred dollars between the three airpods on sale now it kind of doesn't feel like there's a space in the lineup for it for and, it to be a real thing and airpods don't there's no there's not a problem with marketing airpods and- yeah <laughs> yeah they're not having a problem selling them it, 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 it's the, the the fact of the matter is that they can go even higher and people will still be interested if there's a compelling product to sell yeah so i i want there to be Well, okay, let me put it this way. I personally like the AirPods style that isn't the Pro style. Uh, But I want there to be new AirPods that have, like, the smaller tips. Yeah, the the, the, the 200, even, like, if it's been $200 on second-generation AirPods with a charging case, they they look dated now to me compared to AirPods. Yeah, like, have the shorter stems, right? You know, bring the some of the app. The, and that, the that's Apple's doing a, that's doing a coin battery instead of the stick battery, and, and mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Like, so if they could, if that's what they mean by AirPods Pro Lite, which are you know like the the standard 
AirPods but with shorter stems. So that's cool. And that can and that would obviously just be a new generation. AirPods of Pro third AirPods. generation, basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just weird. Or Air, AirPods third generation instead of AirPods, AirPods Pro. AirPods third generation, yeah. yeah. It's just kind of weird that uh, Digitimes keeps referring to them specifically as AirPods Pro Lite, but they don't know what the marketing is going to be. They don't know what the brand is. Maybe someone saw it and it just kind of looked like AirPods Pro because it had shorter stems. And they're yeah. like, okay, there we go. It's going to yeah. be. Okay, so well, that'd be cool. that is my is... explanation is that it's mm-hmm. AirPods third generation. Yeah, if they just did a redesign where you have the AirPods look more like AirPods Pro, but they're still sitting in your ear and they're not, you know, the um, little tips, you know, that you put on them, then that's more compelling. And of course, the marketing. Yeah, but yeah, do the shorter stems and do the button, not the weird double tap. Yeah, that's that's compelling. It's just the, the new AirPods, you know, third generation, the third take on this. Um, and then there's also this 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 <laughs> leak that keeps happening, which is. Um, by way of uh, iOS code, uh, or as of today, an FCC filing that was publicly listed for Powerbeats that are not Powerbeats that you can buy today. They're a corded version of Powerbeats. They look like the shape of Powerbeats Pro, um, so they're not Powerbeats 3 wireless, but they're shaped like Powerbeats Pro, but with a cord. Um, and, and so whereas Powerbeats Pro are truly wireless, they have this different shape to it that looks more modern. Um, then these seem like Powerbeats Pro with a cord, call them Powerbeats 4. Maybe you've got better battery life than you get with Powerbeats Pro, a cheaper price point because they're not truly wireless. These seem to be imminent because they're, they're all over the place. They're supported by the iOS version that's in beta right now. And the FCC yeah, give, give it a H1 chip that gives you yeah Hello gives Siri you, support mm-hmm, exactly the 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 same improvements that you get from going from AirPods one to AirPods two in terms of latency changes and everything mm-hmm. uh, yeah so so that, and, and this seems like a product you know but it, take the price of um, we'll just take probably three out of the lineup and put these in that's that's what they yeah. this would be which would be good yeah and I did actually look at the um, FCC letter because Apple has to send off a letter to the FCC every single time they send them a product review Mm -hmm. telling them basically what stuff they don't want to be redacted yes uh, or sorry what stuff they want to be hidden and in that letter it says they have they list everything that they don't want to release and all the things they listed are not available on this FCC filing at the bottom of the letter it says we understand that the FCC does not let us redact the label location and the model number full stop obviously like having a go at them they can't also redact that information yeah and lo and behold that is essentially what came out today uh-huh. is a picture of where the label is uh, a drawing of the thing and the model number which is apparently a a2015 yeah and so i think apple knew that this was going to happen uh it is slightly weird that they didn't preempt it with an official announcement yes, yeah, right yeah but we have seen awkwardness between apple and beats pr before right like sometimes they haven't quite got their things in order and i think beats the beats division in general doesn't quite have the same uh nickel for secrecy and you know product unveilings and of as you know mainline apple does so we'll probably see these announced soon enough you know if they require 13.4 then sometime in march mm-hmm. This week, 9 to 5 Mac Happy Hour is sponsored by Hyper and their next generation of USB-C hubs. And thanks to Hyper, we're giving 9 to 5 Mac readers the chance to win Apple's new Mac Pro. Yeah, you heard that right. The new $5,999 Mac Pro could be yours just by entering the Hyper giveaway. Hyper is launching its new HyperDrive Gen 2 USB-C hub, offering double the video refresh speed, double the data transfer, and double power delivery over any of Hyper's previous hubs. In a single box, the Gen 2 delivers 4K 60Hz HDMI with HDR video output, 300 megabytes per second micro SD and SD card slot reading, 10 gigabit USB A Gen 2 ports, and 100 watt USB C power delivery. That means the dock can fully charge a 16 inch MacBook Pro whilst it is being used under load. Now, the HyperDrive Gen 2 is available in three models. There's a 6-port, a 12-port, and an 8-port option. It's designed with a minimalist and industrial aesthetic. The hub has this cool, like, rugged metallic exterior. It's all silver. It's really nice. And the ridges in the product kind of act like a little heat sink, so it helps with heat dissipation, so it's cool to the touch and move around. And you can stand the hub vertically upright or horizontally flat, whichever you prefer. 
and commonly accessed ports like the memory card, USB ports and headphone jack are conveniently positioned on the front of the product, whereas ports that are more used for like per- more permanent connections are positioned on the back for better cable management. You can get 40% off the expected retail price with pre-orders on Kickstarter starting at just $59. Find the link in the show notes to check out the Hyperdrive Gen 2 Hub and for details on how to win a Mac Pro. Thanks to Hyper for sponsoring the show. Hi, Mayo. There's another big story this week from <laughs> Ming-Chi Kuo. This is a pretty pretty good week for stories. Um, and Ming-Chi Kuo and an investor release talking about the supply chain and who to pay attention to and who to be concerned about. And the whole topic of this big release is the coronavirus. He includes that Apple will have their first ARM Mac or their first in-house designed processor Mac by 2021. Is that right? Yeah, by the first half of 2021. First half of, of next year. Yeah. yeah. And the whole point of it, it's just so funny the way that Ming-Chi Kuo works and that it's, it's, it's not like Ming-Chi Kuo rumors. It's like, you know, it's like these are investor documents and this was about coronavirus <laughs> and like risk and hits and who to pay attention to and who to be worried about. And this is his information he has to include, so that's where it goes. Yeah, T, T of Industries should like hire some English blogger and make like <laughs> Apple Rumors, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. AppleRumorBytes dot com, yeah, and just do what you know what we do, which is translate the <laughs> investor, uh, the investor reports that we get sent into you know the actual product phase of stuff. So you know. TF Securities are kind of missing a trick because they could do that themselves and yes. then have everyone link to their blog, right? But yeah. for whatever reason, they're just like some, you know, old fashioned investment house where they don't release these things, but yeah. you just get sent like a PDF that we have to read. Whole other industry uh, that I guess works out for them. <laughs> yeah, obviously, you know, they're, they're they're making loads of money from doing the investment advice for all the random suppliers, but they could literally just like hire someone in America to, you know do whatever what me or what you know what, what we do essentially and 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 do it directly but yeah, basically you know, Ming-Chi provide a, the service when they don't yeah ming chi quote outsources the podcast to us we, we yeah. The challenge. <laughs> yeah so basically this story said that uh, apple is ramping more aggressive production of five nanometer process which will be part of the full iphone he's also again mentioned the mini led ipad in the fall Right, featuring the five nanometer chip, which will be like the A14 and the A14X, and then an in-house uh, five nanometer chip for Max by the first half of 2021. Technically, it doesn't say that it's going to be an ARM processor, but it's going to be an ARM processor. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and they you know, the, they've done in-house chips. So it's like part of my storytelling on this is that it's. Um, to, to read into it as anything, you've got to assume that they replace Intel with something else, and so then you go to ARM, um, I, I, because they've done Max with ARM coprocessors for mm-hmm. other tasks with Intel as like the CPU, and this would be that the CPU is like the model of iPhone and iPad, where it's Apple's design CPU based on the ARM architecture, and that's what's there instead of the Intel CPU, right? Yes. Yeah. Because obviously we've had the T1 chip and the T2 chip, but they work alongside uh, the Intel chip, and the Intel chip's doing the heavy lifting of actually being the application processor, right? Like, and we've seen the T2 chip do more than what T1 did, and that it now like controls all of the storage and the SSD controllers and the screen brightness stuff. And they've obviously been ramping up the amount of stuff that the coprocessor does, but clearly the end goal is to replace the application processor as well. Because when Apple makes it in-house, they can do it cheaper. They can do it directly to their specification for the products that they have on their own roadmaps, right? They don't have to be beholden to, you know, whatever Intel's releasing. And we've seen plenty of times in the last few years where Intel delays have caused issues for Apple's, you know, Mac releases. Most notably, the MacBook Air, the 2018 MacBook Air, was, according to, you know, some things I heard, was meant to be like a 2016 product. And Intel roadmap delays just meant it got kept pushing back. And then in like the middle of 2017, they realized that the processor they wanted to use was still going to be delayed. So then they had to like rework the body to support a slightly worse processor. So they had to make, you know, make compromises just to support the Intel chip that would be available. And then that finally came out in late 2018 with Retina, with a Retina display. 
you know, be- belatedly, the MacBook Air got Retina in 2018. Uh, so they can they can you know stick to their own schedules. They can make processes directly designed to what they need, and they'll be cheaper because they don't have to pay Intel the <laughs> the, the profit margin that Intel has to make to make them. So it's a win win in Apple's books. Mm-hmm. We've seen them excel in making custom silicon for iphone and ipad they've already started doing it for mac and everything we hear they're continuing to grow their custom silicon division they'll be making their own modem soon they designed they went from designing just the cpu to designing the gpu as well like all of this stuff we've always heard apple is making more and more of their chips in-house and it makes perfect sense that the mac is the next target uh obviously what we haven't seen Apple release to date is a Mac chip or a, or, a, or um, an ARM chip that would be able to really supplant the kind of like the Xeon workstation stuff in the higher end of the Mac line, like iMac Pro and like Mac Pro. But I don't think that's a problem. This is a transition that's going to take many years anyway. Uh, I think it's perfectly acceptable for them to do ARM chips starting with the lower end laptops and then working their way up and maybe one day they'll you know tackle the iMac Pro and then maybe at some point in you know the 5 year 10 year time frame they can do an all arm Mac Pro as well I mean, it's funny to think about that the, what what they could do with um with their own chips in different form factors than iPad Pro because that's as high end as it gets right now is the iPad Pro and it's a mobile device and they have the Apple TV where it's like plugged in all the time you know but but they don't <laughs> it uses old chips now and like it's, it's like what i'm thinking about is that they could have a chip that far exceeds what the chip in the ipad pro does but is limited by the form factor and if they had you know something mm-hmm. that was just plugged into a wall <laughs> like an imac or a mac mini or a mac pro then it would just be a whole different set of rules than what they have on on ipad um not that that's that's the limiting factor on ipad i mean when you do this then you get really great battery life and then when you go even- yeah exactly like that's how good their arm silicon is yeah. like even on the super thin ipad which is thinner than any mac book right it can still be incredibly incredibly fast with no fan with, and no heating problems with no fan right like it's just inevitable that they're going to translate that power and performance efficiency to the laptop line yeah and they could keep the laptops the same size and ramp up the power, right, and make them really performant. Or they could keep the laptops the same size and just have the same efficiency chips but have really long battery life, right? Or they could make the, the laptops really thin and light and have a really cool portable laptop, kind of like the 12-inch MacBook that they had for a while, mm-hmm. right? And have mm-hmm. still good performance but in a really slim, you know, Ultrabook, real Ultrabook design, again, fanless. Uh, and and the ARM version would still be way faster than what, you know even the latest generation of the 12 inch MacBook, which has always had a reputation of being slow, and it got slightly better by the 2017 version, but still it was slow. Slow and hard. ARM yeah. chip. The the iPad, the 2018 iPad chip would smoke it alive. So, uh, and that's already you know a year old at this point. And they probably can do a MacBook Air, and if they want to, another revision of the MacBook Air that is smaller. And yet still is faster and has better battery life than the MacBook Air does today, right? Yeah. Like, they have so much room and overhead to play with. Just looking... You can just look at the Geekbench scores for... You know, the, the iPad Pro is, what, like, 5.6 millimeters thin, right? And it houses a screen in that as well. <laughs> like, the base of a laptop is thicker than 5.5 millimeters, and it doesn't have to have the screen in it either. So you can just see in a slightly more unconstrained form factor, i.e. a Mac laptop... Whether it's a, you know, a, 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 a MacBook Air or a MacBook Pro, like they could, you know, have a really, really fast chip that also gets really, really great battery life. And the hold up is not so much in the silicon; it's more just in the ecosystem of supporting the silicon, right? Like the reality is, emulation of x86, which is you know the Intel. Intel chipset stuff x86 on an ARM chip is not good. It's very very slow. There's high penalties to emulating cross architecture like that. Is it out of the question that Apple could do it? No, they could. They could. I don't think they will. And even if they did offer it for like pro applications like Logic and Final Cut, the performance penalty 
is going to be big enough that you, you won't want to bother emulating, right? Like it will, like in if you're emulating, you're not going to beat the performance of an Intel machine, right? Because let's say Apple's processors are fifty percent better in performance and per watt efficiency, emulation is like you know at least fifty percent cost, probably more, right? Like it can be up to like seventy five percent cost just to emulate. Mm-hmm. So. I think there's a very clearly defined path, at least in my headspace, where Apple does not offer emulation of any kind, and they can still release a very compelling ARM-based Mac laptop within, you know, within the year, perfectly in time for the you know first half of twenty one time frame. That is an entry level machine, so it's not going for the MacBook Pro yet, right? It's going, it's heading at somewhere between the twelve inch that used to exist and a MacBook Air, right? So. Better than a MacBook Air with a whole ARM chip that doesn't have emu- emu- any emulation at all. So it'll be running pure native ARM apps. And yes, that means a lot of apps won't be updated in time for when it comes out. But I don't think it matters on on the lower end of Apple's lineup, right? Like, the, the, there are millions of people that buy MacBook Airs that do not have any interest in the majority of professional applications you need like safari and chrome and all of apple's apps and then maybe word in some form Mm -hmm. right maybe the office suite but again you have office online you have office catalyst is something that microsoft could put across if they don't want to just do the office for mac recompiled for arm right like i think there's enough uh gears there that can be turned to create a laptop that doesn't have any legacy baggage, but is still a compelling product that people would want to buy. Mm -hmm. And now Ming-Chi Kuo has a day on it by the first half of next year. Yeah, like, I have a MacBook Pro, right? And I'm, you know, I'm a professional worker. I make apps, right? I do development. But if you strip away the Xcode stuff and, and, you know, the terminal scripting stuff... Uh, yeah, I'm. I think I'm pretty average usage of a computer. I use Safari. I use Twitter. I use email. I use music. I use it, uh, photos. Right, and ninety percent of the apps I just named, or the apps that I use, are comp- all Apple apps that will get updated. Of course, right, because they're the system apps. The one or two utilities that I use from the Mac App Store that aren't made from Apple, good chance they get updated soon. You know, if they're not there on day one, maybe they'll be be there within a month. Maybe they'll be there within a, within the year, right? I think I don't think there's a, a worry about availability of software for laptops because, especially like the MacBook Air and you know the 12 inch MacBook, you know, most people just spend their day using Safari or using a Chrome or using a web browser and not much else, right? Like, and that's fine because you know you can get loads of done inside a web browser. But you don't need to support Photoshop, Logic, even though Logic's made by Apple, you know, um, all the pro apps like that are essential for, uh, you know, Xcode stuff. All of that stuff is you know is essential for working, but the lower end laptops generally don't target those markets really right like you've got the 13 inch MacBook pro that can stay on intel for another year if it has to another two years right like the the existence of what i think of like as an arm MacBook Air is the catalyst not not catalyst but <laughs> but motivation for the big guys to start transferring their apps and getting them slowly moving over to an arm base right so you know photoshop probably won't be there on day one but maybe at, you know the fact that suddenly apple's making arm machines will then push adobe's backside into okay we need to make a mac photoshop that is that can run an arm and you know recompilation for architectures is not a trivial job especially for big apps like photoshop that have you know loads of legacy code in them but it's not like making the app from scratch all over again right we've already seen apple go through several architecture transitions on ios from 32 bit to 64 bit they did 32-bit, 64-bit on macOS with Catalina. And yes, a lot of old software has been left behind. But I don't think many people are crying too much about it. In the the wider scheme, especially people buying MacBook Airs. Hiring these days takes time. 
time that you often don't have. Sometimes filling a role is urgent, and filling a role with a quality candidate that is truly meant for your business is hard. So how do you do it? It isn't as simple as putting an ad in the newspaper anymore, and this is where LinkedIn Jobs comes in. It's the best place to post your job. Get up and running from the LinkedIn Jobs dashboard. Simply start with your company name, job title, and location. Education and grades are important, but LinkedIn also considers qualities like collaboration, work ethic, and adaptability. LinkedIn Jobs finds people that are not only qualified, but fit in with your company's culture. LinkedIn does the legwork to find the most qualified candidates so you can focus on hiring the person who will transform your business. It looks beyond plain work skills and connects you with candidates who match your business perfectly. LinkedIn makes sure your job post gets in front of the people that you want to hire. And it's no wonder a person is hired every eight seconds on LinkedIn. Companies rated LinkedIn Jobs the number one hiring platform for delivering quality hires. Find the right person for your business today with LinkedIn Jobs. You can pay what you want and get the first $50 off. Just visit linkedin.com slash happy hour. Again, that's linkedin.com slash happy hour to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. And thanks to LinkedIn Jobs for sponsoring the show. All right, Mayo, 9 to 5 Mac has a pretty cool story this week. Uh, this is by way of um, our, our colleague, uh, Felipe. And he has discovered that in the iOS beta code, there's evidence that OS recovery without a computer is coming, it seems like. So if you're, mm-hmm. you brick your phone and you just want to get back to a working state of iOS – that right now what you need to do is connect to a Mac or PC with with iTunes or Finder. And uh, what seems to be coming in, in code as a, as a feature feature is the ability to, like you can do with a Mac, be connected to the internet. And some version of your phone is still intelligent enough to look at the internet, erase your drive, and reinstall iOS from scratch. And if you've got a backup, then restore Something you can't do today, but it appears to be coming, right? Mm-hmm. And it might it might include like, you know, if you've got, a f- you might have to use like a second iOS device to restore the first one because one thing that kind of uh, came out was a screenshot that kind of looks like the, um, it's like, like the password this... sharing UI mm-hmm. or the AirPod sharing UI, right? Like that little card, and it says, you know, normally it says like connect, and this one says start restore. So. If your, you know, if your lap, if your phone is in a brick state where it needs restoring, it's not going to be able to generate that card UI. So presumably, that card UI is on a second device. Yeah, that's kind of but... like the proximity screen, like something's nearby interacting, mm-hmm. and you can like connect to it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so it seems like maybe if you had like your wife's phone, you put it next to your phone, and either with a cable or wirelessly, it can, you know, download the fairware and, and flash it, basically replacing what iTunes can do for you today where you take it into DFU mode, you then plug it into the computer and then you can flash the firmware, right? Mm-hmm. But because you can only do it on a computer, it's kind of limiting, especially for like the iPad Pros, which are meant to be standalone machines. Replace it, yeah. Yeah, and if you get into a state where you do need DFU mode today and you're just a lame, you're just a lay person and you call up Apple, Apple support, they will tell you to come to an Apple store because they'll plug it into one of their Macs that they have in the store and restore it there, right? And it's just a massive inefficiency that they, you know, have gotten away with for a decade. Yeah. But iPhones should be able to tackle the problem. Yeah, iPhones could service other iPhones, and your iPad should be able to service your iPhone and vice versa. And yeah, and completely possible. independent in, in, uh, internet recovery would be great too if they can manage that as well. That's right. Yeah. And and when we're getting in this this the hard drive sizes that we've got or you know the flash storage amounts that we've got these days you know we're, we're long gone from eight and sixteen gigabyte storage you know like the base was we kind of started out with sixty four these days for an iPhone so yeah it, base it, is sixty four now yeah so it's not crazy to to be able to just partition a recovery slot like you do on Macs at some yeah point. that's a fair point because on Macs like. The OS is what, like twenty gigs, so you basically take up a recovery partition of about ten gigs, I think, which mm-hmm. allows you to do the, you know, command R, option R, even on you know, goes, Mac with yeah. one hundred twenty gigabytes, which you can get, you know, iPads, iPhones with more than that. Yeah, exactly. So, 
Uh, and you know maybe it's not a thing on that they put on the 64 gigabyte models, but if you have you know 256 gigabyte phone, you could probably spare a 10 gigabyte chunk of that for mm-hmm. disaster recovery situations. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, it's just a perfect thing of like the platform matures, all the little edge cases where you still need a, com- a real computer today need to be sorted out eventually. And that's right. This is definitely a big one. It's like a big long continuation of ios 5 when you cut the mm-hmm. cord from having to update your software with a pc or mac uh and you finally got over your updates this should be over the air restore um but you can't do it yet the other thing is that there's this this rumor that iphones in the not so distant future will drop the lightning port for not USB C, but no port at all and be totally portless and this will be like a high end phone um in the lineup and this would be needed for that. If you can't do um a cable, a wired restore, you need to have some kind of a wireless restore and this seems like that this would be required for that wireless world. Well there's portless and then there's portless, right? Like, yeah, that's true. There's I mean there's the there's, Apple Watch is portless, but you know, if you get in there, you can unscrew that little door, and then there's the diagnostics port, which Apple will use to restore the firmware on it. Do they still do that anymore? I don't know if they do that anymore. Yeah, the, the, well, the port's still there. They do a lot of replacing the watch in general. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know the frequency of the number of times they just replace the whole watch versus yeah. actually... They, they don't access that port in an Apple store, is my understanding, right? Like the, yes, yeah. and, and I think a lot of the time the port's just used for, like, debugging. So, like, they send it off to engineering to it's work like the, out what went the wrong. the black box on an airplane. Like what went yeah, wrong? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like they don't use it to like fix your watch and give it back to you. They use it for their own internal thing to work out what went wrong. You know, how can we stop this from happening in yeah. the future? But obviously, that port's still there. Or, you know, even on the latest Series Fives, if you, it's like on the inside of one of the band hole thingies. Mm. You have a little thing that you can unscrew, and there's a nine port thing. If you look at the um, Apple TV, the latest generation. It was only, what, like a couple of months ago when someone discovered that in the <laughs> it's, Ethernet it's, port... Yeah, well, there's no, you, like, there's no Ethernet, is there? It's just it's USB-C on the 4K no, model? No, the, the Apple TV has Ethernet, right? The 4K model? Maybe. Uh, uh, it's been so long since they refreshed these things, but... <laughs> I believe it does have Ethernet. I mean, my Apple TV is 2015 models, which definitely do have Ethernet. I'm pretty sure the 4K model has Ethernet. Yeah, that's right. It, it, what it was that I'm thinking about is that the Apple TV 4 had faster Wi-Fi than Ethernet. It didn't have a gigabit yet. But yeah, cor- yeah, 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 because Apple TV 4K has gigabit Ethernet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they dropped the USB-C port from it. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's so no service if port, you look on the back se. of it, it doesn't have any ports but the Ethernet port, but... What someone discovered, like a jailbreak developer, whether if you like peel up the Ethernet port and you know stare at it really, really closely, there is basically like another diagnostics port in there, and it's for... it's like a lightning connector mm-hmm. in the in the Ethernet port. Yeah, so this this is yeah yeah this this came out in October of last year. So presumably, which is way after that was on the market. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like three years after, yeah. presumably a portless iPhone would have some kind of diagnostics port hidden somewhere, maybe inside of the, like the SIM card tray, right? Mm. Uh, but it's kind of a port, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a port in its own. But obviously, you know, having wireless recovery helps. But I don't think that the portless iPhone in 20, late 2021 will be, you know, actually portless to the point where nothing can actually get plugged into yep. it. But I, I would say, like, if you go on an Apple store, they might say, like, let's use this method before we you know snap apart yep. your phone and and go the long way but this yep. this to be more convenient than that um yeah perfectly reasonable yep the other thing is there, there's, a, there's a new rumor about something called 802.11 a a y it's a it's a y it's a y but all i can see when i see a y is 802.11 a and <laughs> this is further confusion of you know we went from 802.11 n data to 11 um ac ax now a y but we were talking about wi-fi five six and we were kind of retroactively have one two three four and but now we still got all these flavors and this it's so confusing but this is just another strand of wi-fi that's a very specialized version of wi-fi i guess and there's there's a possibility that this 802.11 a could be in the iphone 12 correct yeah. yes this is yeah. a makatakara report Makataka is pretty reliable in general. Makataka, uh, hey, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, what we know is like Wi-Fi 1 through Wi-Fi 6, they run on uh, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so they're like the traditional Wi-Fi bands. 
uh, this 802.11 AY thing is runs on different bands, a uh, 60 gigahertz spectrum, which is ultra short range. Okay. So you won't see like a Wi Fi router come out anytime soon with 802.11. Hey! Super. That will still be 802.11. Ah! It wouldn't, wouldn't fill your house. It would feel like your. Feel chair. like the room, yeah, maybe. Yeah. 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 And it wouldn't go through. And it wouldn't penetrate the wall. So um, this would be useful for things like airdrop because basically it's like a version of bluetooth but much faster right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so it's short range high speed wireless communication uh they, that's all where um, makataka says it doesn't say what it could be used for like it doesn't say that apple's going to use it for x but obviously you can think of things like airdrop maybe a uh, better connection to an apple watch that's nearby for faster data transfer that way potentially apple ar glasses might need a higher bandwidth communication model so mm-hmm. maybe the uh, the spectrum can be used there as well. So that the AR glasses are not like the Apple Watch first generation where it's a cool concept, but it's so slow that this, this yeah. is the technology that exists to prevent that. Yeah, so maybe. obviously that's just, a th- that's just hypothetical. Yeah, right? We don't know for sure what they could use it for. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could just be as simple as faster airdrop, which would be nice because airdrop you know, is fast, but it could be faster. You, you know, airdrop is one of those things where if you get caught airdropping um, like a large 4K video that's longer than a couple of minutes, your your phone's like done. It's it's modal. It, that thing is – you watch it load. Um, the sender can escape, but I don't think the receiver can escape. Yeah, you have to sit on that screen. Yeah, you're, you're there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be, that'd be nice to see. Also in the and and there was one person on Twitter who was like, Apple's normally pretty conservative in adopting wise technology, and that is true for the most part. But last year they did Wi-Fi six in the iPhone eleven, so they definitely diverge when they need to. And they added Wi-Fi six to the iPhone eleven without much explanation for it, really. That's, like it wasn't like right. they had an Apple product need for it. They just kind of like. Here's Wi-Fi six. It's out on the iPhone before it. Like the Mac Pro doesn't support Wi-Fi six. No, no Mac, no, no Mac. Yeah, no yeah. Mac because of Intel apparently. Uh, another reason why Apple wants to switch away from them. Mm. Uh, and then separately in the Mac Attacker report, uh, there was a little comment on the Apple Air Tags, which is their competitor to Tar Trackers. Uh, Mac Attacker says it's going to come out in the fall, which lines up with what we talked about in the Quo situation last week. Uh, but interestingly. Uh, Mac Attacker said that the tags would be completely waterproof, which makes sense because obviously if you're attaching them to things, you want them to be able to lost the in the water and the washing machine. Yeah. yeah. And there's been a question about whether the tags would be charged by an internal battery that runs dry and then they're essentially disposable, or if there'd be some kind of like recharging system. Because the tiles, I think the newest tile you can charge, you can recharge, but most of them are just like they just last for four years and then you throw them away, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah. Apple's environmental approach probably doesn't like things that are disposable. I don't think the market like likes things that are like the, the tiles that you just had to replace. It's like you're you're forever to use a system subscribing to future hardware, and that's no good when you can just change the battery out on those. I mean, and Apple has, I mean, <laughs> they haven't done much better, and with 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 small electronics like AirPods. Um, yeah, it's the same situation where they're rechargeable, but once the battery is done, it's they're done. Fast. Yeah, but they're so yeah, small. So, and, uh, yeah. yeah, so just because they're rechargeable doesn't mean they're going to last forever. That's right. Which is a fair point. Yeah, uh, but apparently Makataka says the AirTags would be rechargeable, uh, recharge wirelessly using kind of like an inductive charger similar to the Apple Watch magnetic charger. Mm-hmm. Not clear if it would be the exact charger or something related to that. Uh, I, I thought nice. about this as like a coin, like the kind of coin battery that you, the user services itself. So you you put it in the CR, whatever twenty two, whatever these these battery names are. Yeah. And you know you get them at 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 your electronic shop or your grocery store, and they're just coins, like kind of like what you see in the AirPods Pro. Um, you just can access those, but that mm-hmm. they last, you know, for one year, two years, and the benefit is that the hardware itself lasts for as long as it does. The battery is is obviously. Like in a TV remote, you know, it's it's got a, a life of its own, and yeah. that life is much shorter than the overall product. Um, and then, and then you won't you don't deal with recharging because who wants to recharge these trackers? Uh, well, I th- I still think they'd have a long battery life. Uh, like it wouldn't be like you recharge them every day. It'd be like you know every three months, six months, that kind of that kind of time scale. Yeah, I, I don't want to recharge these things, but but I, I get that. That's but you don't want to replace the batteries on a Miva, right? So yeah, if you can last for a year and then you just swap the battery out, is that 
you know, it's not too different. Think about like the the, the old um, the old Apple TV remote, the, you know, the silver one that had the coin yeah, battery, yeah, yeah. and that one. Like I ever change the battery in that, but then with the rechargeable one, I do, I do, you know, it, it has more power required for it anyway. But yeah, these these don't even exist yeah. yet, so it's I mean, a problem for another day. Rechargeable tag that still lasts like a year on one charge, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I think because obviously recharging is always nicer than having to get an actual battery, and you know, it's not Apple style to have like this room, this battery window where you can pop in a you know cell battery like, anymore, just, right? Yeah. Yeah, anymore. That's not, you know, that's clearly not the direction. So if it was a rechargeable tag that could last a year, that'd be like great. I think given that they're going for something more sophisticated than what we see in just like a dumb Bluetooth tracker, like with the ultra wideband stuff, uh, probably going to look at shorter battery life than that. Like, I think you have to be, I, I mean, I would say like six months is reasonable, right? So it's not too annoying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we'll see. We'll obviously, we have, we don't fully know the, product specs for this thing yet That's we right. kind of have a rough idea about where it's going but obviously it depends on exactly what it is if it can provide like real-time location then clearly the battery life is going to be shorter but yeah, yeah. We- we'll see uh it'd be nice if they could reuse the apple watch charger and if they're not using the re- apple watch charger maybe it's just like a chi compatible which would tie into the quo rumor that said they were going to make a smaller wireless charger because <laughs> that's right you could have a small wireless charger that can also charge the tags and that's synergy do you think we've let go of the rumor that the iphone will get the, the samsung feature where you you can top off something else with you know charging in the back of it because oh, that's that, a good question that was that was rumored for the 11 cycle and it just didn't happen and it's I mean, yeah it's, it was like supposed to, like the, the it was like on track for 11 but then at the last minute they didn't they couldn't pull it off so they they delayed it yeah yeah, that's that feature. Never been like, I've been like bowled over by it. Like, oh, that's so good. And you know, quite a lot of Samsung phones have it now, and I don't really see people like using it or saying that oh, this feature is really good. The iPhone needs it, so I'm not like bound to it. But it would be nice if you could like recharge your AirPods on the back of your phone. I hope it isn't gone because I think it's a it's a cool a cool concept. It's like yeah. how you can plug yeah, in I your think, phone. I think I think it's cooler iPad. for like recharging AirPods versus like recharging someone else's phone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and the whole, the watch thing is neat. Like if if they make that work, but that was a whole. I mean, we had a whole year of that rumor, and then it went away. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the podcasts that I listened to, so did the, the commentary was like, never wanted it in the first place, and I, know, <laughs> I, I do want it. Bring it back. So yeah, I, I, I think we are consistent on that, right? Like I'm pretty sure I was always saying it'd be good for like headphones, but I think for an actual second phone, it'd be kind of. Stupid. We never saw what they do with the watch unless they change the watch some way it, way it sits yeah. flush. So yeah. Um, S Air Tags, more on that later this year, it seems like. We we did get news in the home kit world, which is that the second of two features promised in home kit with iOS 13 has has arrived. The first was home kit secure video. We see multiple versions of home kit secure video implemented by different camera makers, including Logitech and Tatmo. Uh, now we've got home kit routers, or as you say, routers. And uh, we've got one so far, which is Eero, which is owned by Amazon, um, purchased by Amazon last year. Amazon also had purchased Ring, which was promising home kit support for their doorbell system. Hasn't happened yet. They they said that the Amazon acquisition wasn't a factor, that they were still working on it. Um, but that seems to be a whole other issue. Being bought by Amazon for Euro was not a factor. They did release HomeKit uh, router support, as promised. Um, and then there's there are two more. One, I think, is the um, the modem router combination that you get from Spectrum. If you're a Spectrum customer, I think that's mm-hmm. the, the correct uh, provider. And then the yeah. other, other is Linksys Velop, which is the mesh Wi-Fi system that Apple promoted first whenever they ended their line of airport routers. What they, 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 they leaned on Linksys as their recommendation. There's also um, – and, and that, that doesn't have HomeKit support yet for Linksys. You're only working with Eero so far, but Linksys is coming. They, they had a hint that they were going to be coming soon. They walked that back a little bit as like a misspeak, um, but they have at least listed which products will support it. There's a big question mark to me. Uh, will the Wi-Fi 6 model of the Linksys Velop work with it? Because it seems that the consensus so far is no, not yet, that you'll have to use the um, – uh, 802.11ac, not AX routers, to work with this, which is kind of crazy that the the more expensive, more modern one won't work with it yet. But um, I guess just priority of of what's been produced in this in, in use. 
Uh, at any rate, it's only Eero so far. And um, I have not used it as much as of a home kit enthusiast as, as I've been because I have the Linksys system in, in use right now. I've used Eero before as well. And the network names are the same so that I could just swap out the routers and that everything is online. Um, but it's just it, to, to change routers is one thing. And then to it seems like the process for setting up this stuff is also very uh, involved and the benefit is preventative, not something that, that you get added. So um, I've not yet experienced home care routers. And, but we have seen a lot more about how it will work and kind of how you control this, right? Yeah, and we've seen other people do it. And it's as we expected. I said, we both said a few weeks ago, like, don't get too excited, right? Uh, and that's what it is. It's just, you know, better security for your home kit devices and the other... And, like, essentially... At its high security level, each individual HomeKit device is isolated from every everything else on your network, including the other HomeKit devices, which does give a lot of security. But and 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 when it's in those like silos, it can only talk the HomeKit protocol right at the highest level of security. So that does mean that if you have like a you know Logitech camera that also has its own firmware. Right, you can be rest assured it's only talking through Logitech's bad example because right now you have to flash the firmware and it converts it to HomeKit camera only. Mm-hmm. Uh, you think of a different HomeKit camera, right? <laughs> that if you if you put it on the high security mode on your HomeKit router, it would only be able to talk the HomeKit spec to your devices and your home hubs and everything, and any other feature on that camera would not be able to get to the network, right? So if a hack came in that was sending some data off to some server in, you know, Iceland. I don't know why I said Iceland, but go for it. <laughs> There's bad Iceland, <laughs> folks. We lost the, all the, the Iceland data listeners. would not be able to leave because you can only talk the HomeKit protocol specification, right? Mm-hmm. So that is the security benefit. But that is only when you're on the high security mode for your accessory because when you set up a HomeKit router, you basically say on a per accessory basis whether you want to be an automatic, no security, or maximum security. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, most of your accessories you're going to want to put on the automatic mode because that still allows through communication with like third party apps. Because if you had this this camera that you put on the high security mode, you'd only be able to use the HomeKit features because anything else that that, that camera can do, including just talking to its own third party app, would be out of bounds because it would never connect. So very few accessories you're going to put on that highest tier of security and the ones that you do maybe like lights right you know there's not much opportunity for a light to be hacked in a way that is really destructive right so you could put your lights on the high security level but it's 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 fine right and it's good that this feature exists and if you're just someone who just has is coming to HomeKit for the first time and you happen to have a compatible router and you start setting them up and you can get the the extra security that's great but For most people, I think, you know, changing your current setup to do it is just not worth the hassle. Like the feature trade-off is not worth the effort involved. Yeah. And we've seen plenty of examples this week of people doing it, Mm -hmm. you know, following all the steps, but something just goes wrong and some of their accessories don't connect anymore. So like, you know, when you're going into like home secure video, for instance, you know the trade-offs, but you're also getting a lot of beneficial features, right? For this... You're not really getting any features, so I wouldn't fret too much about it. I have Orbi routers; they don't have any, you know, roadmap for supporting HomeKit secure routers at the moment, and I'm, you know, not not bothered at all. Let me put it that no way. fear. There's no FOMO there. Um, for me, I I like this concept because when you think of the the pitch of HomeKit, uh, uh, one angle of that is that you've got one app, the Home app, that talks the same language as all your smart home accessories from different vendors, and so you've got one app that can control them hopefully, um, without having to jump between like 15 different apps. Um, so that's one, that's one part of it is just one language to speak. Um, and then, you know, I think, I think if you're going into smart home stuff, a lot of people that aren't, that are just doing it for like for the practical use and not for like just the, for the sake of trying it out, will stick with one platform. And so it's, yep. it's very common to go home kit and not care about Alexa or Google assistant. And, and then it's okay to segment those off and not have those be factors or worry about what are the non-HomeKit features that this hardware can do. 
I don't care. I just want it to be HomeKit. Um, and then you put all of your trust and security in Apple. HomeKit can have its holes, but whatever the third-party company is, their flaws aren't yours to worry about because you're only using the HomeKit kind of, I guess, lane. Um, so I like that. And it's kind of been a pitch of HomeKit is like security in the past, but you've not – because it's also been HomeKit plus everything else that the product can do – You've never been able to say, no, I only want the HomeKit stuff. The closest thing has been HomeKit Secure Video when you literally flash the firmware and then you're running, you know, talking just to Apple and not Logitech servers anymore. Um, and it seems kind of wild that it took this long to get to that level of security. Um, and, I, you know, I'm trying to think about who is this for? Like, would there be any requirements for um, HomeKit, HomeKit implementation that requires this level of security before it could be possible? Um, and I'm not sure that. Yeah, the, I mean, the, if you're making a new home, for instance, mm -hmm. you might as well just get one of the HomeKit routers. If, yeah. if that's, you, I'm, I'm not opposed to this. I'm just, I don't want to change up my router uh, to, yeah. to do it. But when it comes to Linksys of a lot, I, you know, I, I think initially I have to give up the Wi-Fi six router that I'm that I'm testing. But no big deal. That's not a big deal. The only thing I have that works with it is the iPhone, so that's not a factor really. Um, and then. So that, that's, that's one bit of admin, admin work to do. Um, and then if you've got to re-add things in the home app to benefit from it, it's kind which of... you don't always have to do. It's a bit... We haven't quite yeah. worked out the pattern yet of which things have to be re-added, which things just migrate over automatically. It's kind of up in the air. Yeah. Some things and, do and, and some things don't. a bunch of my stuff goes through a bridge. So like there's a bunch of light throughout the house, but they all go through the, the Lutron bridge. Mm -hmm. um, so I imagine it's just adding it one time and then everything else is reflected. So I'm not opposed to the setup process either. It's just I'm, I'm just going to be patient and wait until it comes to my router and not, not switch out to the Euro one. Um, I would use either one, but it, the fact is, is I just have more of the Linksys ones to test than I have Euro ones to test. And yeah. so that's just where I've kind of landed. And the fact that Apple was selling them before they even sold um, Netgear or B, I was like, well, this is the one that Apple supports. Um, in, 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 in practice, the Linksys Falop app is pretty bad, and, and uh, I don't think it's optimized for the plus size phones. And um, <laughs> it's not like the first party experience that you wish you, you could have, even if Apple endorses it. So uh, I'm not married to it. But um, they. Yeah, and to be clear, HomeKit routers. All the other configuration and anything you want to change it still goes through their app. Yeah, right. That's right. When you add home, when you add the HomeKit router to Home app, you you're not you can't get like the settings for the router in the Home app. That's stuff. right. Like that's not that's not the ambition of HomeKit routers. Even though it would be nice if they they did that, would, would be don't. nice. Yep. Um, so yeah, I, it's one of those things where uh, you know HomeKit Secure Video. I was jumping in immediately, and I had a patience for what the bugs would be, uh, and and there were many. Um, but I had a, a pretty good understanding of like this is what you 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 gain from this these features that you wouldn't have otherwise. This is UI that's only exposed if you do this with HomeKit routers. They're tangible user features. Yeah, with HomeKit routers, there is some new UI you get to play with, but like it's mainly an <laughs> administration. Uh, UI. You get a couple of toggles. <laughs> yeah, and then you're done, and then you got to deal with the ramifications after that. So um, I'm not going to jump in and be the beta tester yet. But um, once it comes to Linksys, then I'll I'll you know maybe take the Wi-Fi six router out of, out of commission and. Uh, I think that's that, that's where everything goes through. And so if that's on the network as the main router, then I don't think I'd be able to use it anyway. I imagine eventually they will update that one to work too, but it's not going to be the first one. So it's it's all a lot of work to, you know, kind of a, a, a theoretical feature, not not something that you, you, you know, benefit from every day. So. But I do like it. I mean, if I'm thinking about who is it for, I don't think that they made this because there's some restriction that they, you know, they can only have HomeKit homes if this existed. I think it's that this is how they always want HomeKit to work, um, and they finally been able to in implement it in a way that makes sense and and that's deployable, you know, de de deployable, uh, deployable. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I'm, yeah, it's perfectly fine uh, mm -hmm. if you're starting from you know day one. It makes sense to take advantage of this. Yeah, if you have an existing setup, you know, there's there's no hurry. Mm -hmm. Yep, and uh, finally, uh, I just want to give a shout out to AirPods Pro. We, we mentioned them earlier in the show, but a few weeks ago, I guess because a week and a half ago, um, I fell asleep with a, an AirPod Pro in my ear, and I woke up and it was gone. And my dog found it. My dog Apollo found it, and it was in pieces. And so I, I had I was down the left AirPod Pro, and um, man, I, I appreciate these things so much that I. I went through the process of of, um, of not replacing the whole things, but going through the repair process of saying I've, I've only lost one and I need to replace it. 
And it was pretty smooth. You know, you spend ninety dollars instead of two hundred and fifty dollars, and and you get just the part that you need, the the missing AirPod. Um, but it came within two days of doing that online. Um, there was one hiccup in the process, which is that um, for some reason I didn't find the online form where you like click the buttons yourself and then pick the part and just pay for it, which is a pretty good UI once you find it. I was going through chat and I was relaying the story of what happens and I was trying to be as concise as possible, but there were still all these questions of like, okay, what phone do you have? What OS do you use? You know, how to use your phone that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> all those things that they got to fill out and uh, you know, I was being patient, but, and, and then it, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to send you the uh, form. Do you, you click a button, you pay for the part and it will come to you. And that's it. And I was like, all right, cool. So I did that. I got the email. I clicked on the button to pay for it. I used Apple Pay to pay for it. Done. And then I realized in, in like very faint, like iOS 7 ultra fine uh, style font, it said that it was the right AirPod when in my chat, <laughs> in my chat, I specified the left AirPod. And so at that point I had paid for the wrong AirPod and it was my fault for clicking through and not noticing it first. Um, so that's when I found the UI online where you just click and you like click the one that you want yourself instead of that person doing it for you and i got the one i needed now i've got to sort out how to send back this one i don't need because i don't need a ride airpod <laughs> like an extra one <laughs> you know so for 90 dollars no thanks um but anyway airpods pro like man to, to lose them is to really appreciate them so <laughs> i went um i was going back to using power beats pro for everything just like walking around listening to podcasts and stuff with those and um you know, as as a dad with two kids, I miss noise cancellation and um, just the convenience of like AirPods in your pocket. You know, it's it's a different form factor and they're way more casual than Powerbeats Pro are. I still love Powerbeats Pro for those long runs that I do. But uh, and, I, and as soon as I was wearing Powerbeats Pro for a few days and went back to AirPods Pro, I was looking for like the volume clicker again, just out of habit, of, like turn up the volume, click on my ear. No, I can't do that. Um, but for what they are, I, I really appreciate these things. And um there's, there's one person when I tweeted out the photo that was concerned that the dog would have eaten the battery. And that would have been bad, but um, I it, I didn't feed the dog the, the AirPods. It was an accident. So um, anyway, these things, I, I don't think I'll sleep with them anymore and uh, wake up and, and not immediately find them <laughs> if that's the case. So um, AirPods Pro, they're awesome. Who knew? All right. That is the Happy Hour podcast for this week. You can follow me on Twitter on Insta and Instagram at Apollo Zach. You can check out my side project, Space Explored, at spaceexplored.com and see the space news and history that I'm writing on the side now. And uh, Benjamin, you're on Twitter at... BZA Mayo. And you can follow 9to5Mac on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, at 9to5Mac. You can email us at happyhour at 9to5Mac.com, and we will see your feedback. And uh, we will be back next week. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.